and jokingly, everyone was like, you know what, we're all from different countries, but if we get married, we'll fly you all out to do our weddings. And we all had a laugh. And a few years later, that's literally what's happened. <laughs> I've been no to yeah, America, Australia and stuff like that. What to shoot all or, of those people's weddings? It's Yeah, they, they've literally all got married and then said, can you guys come and do our wedding? So I literally <laughs> just got back from Kenya last week after doing the same thing. So... Welcome to Creative Catalyst, the show that will help inspire you through conversation with creative people telling their stories and how it shaped their career. I'm your host, Chris Campbell, and in this episode, we're going to be talking to a photographer and illustrator based in London. He regularly shoots weddings, but his biggest passion is documentary photography, and this has taken him to places like India and Bangladesh, where he's focused on climate change. Not only this, but as an illustrator, he's worked on books and magazines for people all around the world. His name is Ashley Bloom, and in this episode, we're going to be talking about different learning styles, standing out as a photographer, and the legacy Ashley wants to leave behind. If you want to find Ashley, check him out on Instagram, at Ashley Bloom Images, and on his website, ashleybloom.net. I thought we'd start off with a quote to talk about it. That quote is, which of my photographs is my favorite? The one I'm going to take tomorrow. How do you feel about that quote, Ashley? Yeah, no, I love it. So that's a um, that's a quote by Imogen Cunningham, photographer. And um, I love it when I first came across it because I thought that kind of sums up my approach to uh, photography and illustration and kind of any visual work that I do, um, which is that it's always kind of a growth process. It's always progression. I've been, I think now, probably working professionally as a photographer for about 12 years, 13 years or so. And every single shoot I do, I learn something new. And, um, and that's exciting. I think, I think the day where I kind of go out on the shoot and I come home and I'm like, I didn't learn anything new that day. Um, that's the day to retire. Cause it's, there's always a new challenge. There's always something to, to kind of grow from. So, yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah. I definitely find for myself, I agree with that in the photography concept in yeah. the, in the music concept as well. So with photography, I, I always feel when I teach, it's about collaboration because I'm going to learn something from yeah. that person as well. And everyone has a different perspective. So you can always take something from that as well. Yeah. Uh, and for music, I just feel like I'm so excited for how I'm going to be tomorrow because there are some people who can play the drums like incredibly. Yeah. Uh, and it's trying to push yourself and get inspired to to want to work and do more no, to get better 100%. yourself. And I think like the learning is a reward in itself. You know, the, the actual getting home and thinking, okay, I've got a technique today that I previously I'd never you know, even touched on that, that is rewarding, let alone the actual making the work and getting paid and all of that kind of stuff, you know. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's still something where it's extremely enjoyable to do these processes, whether it's drawing or art um, or photography. And, um, yeah, and that's, that growth is where that enjoyment comes from. Sweet. Now, this, this podcast is called Creative Catalyst. Yes. So when did your love for photography and illustration, like art, when did that start was it from the age of three people said yeah. <laughs> i was a performer from the age of two kind of yeah no it's <laughs> it's funny I, I was i was getting in trouble pretty early on because the you know before i could like walk around i was drawing with crayons on the wall oh really like so um yeah no like art and drawing has always been around um i think mainly because my my mom's a writer she's a performance poet um but also a writer um her name's valley blue quick plug <laughs> um but um <laughs> Uh, but the thing about it is she, her publishers would always send us books, um, like free books. So my house, uh, my parents' house, my house growing up was like a library. There's books everywhere. And so I grew up always reading, but I'm such a visual person. If I had to read a book and there weren't illustrations, I'd have to kind of illustrate it myself. And no take way. It into the book. And I just, I experience things so much more if there's a visual kind of attached to it. Um, and so, yeah, it was always kind of growing up, I, I'd be drawing and sort of from school onwards, people could see, okay, this is what he's got an interest in. This is what he's profession at. And almost from that point, your life is kind of mapped out for you. So when I'm choosing GS- GCSE and A-level subjects, obviously it's, it's going to be art. And, yeah. um, and so I went to university and I studied a foundation degree. Just, just pulling back yeah, yeah. to when it comes to GCSEs. Yeah. I know a lot of people... Like when I was taking my GCSEs, it was very academic focused. Yeah. Like they were like, oh, but you can't do music yeah. and drama because you they're in two separate really? strands. Okay, so if yeah. you choose one, you can't do the other. Yeah, and I'm yeah. like, but I like playing music <laughs> and I like doing drama. Like, <laughs> yeah. what's the deal? Yeah. So for you, when you did that, it 
did you already think that art was going to be your thing? So you naturally, like, no one even blinked an eyelid. They were like, yeah, go for it. Do, yeah. do that. It was a weird one because I, I still didn't know how do you make money from this. So I didn't know. Yeah. Am I going to be like a Picasso or a Rembrandt and just sit in a room and paint with funny clothes on yeah. for the rest of my life? So I didn't know what the career path was. But it was just like, it was kind of unquestioned by everyone. I spent all my time drawing. I actually got suspended from school once because in my lesson, they thought I wasn't paying attention because I was just drawing. But that's how I took notes. That's how yeah. I paid attention. Um, but it was it was just kind of set. I didn't so much have a problem with like, you know, the, the clash of subjects. I, I did drama, I did art, I did history. But um, maybe the way art was taught frustrated me a little bit because I think there's always this backlash. So the backlash when I was at school was it had been taught to mechanically and rigidly and they wanted to get more conceptual so it was more about you know you don't have to draw this perfectly accurately just you know feel it and stuff and be really conceptual with it which I actually hated because I wanted oh, really? to learn how to technically do things well and then kind of move on to experimenting with it whereas it, it felt like we never got to the technical this is how to draw an eye or a face or a hand or anything like yeah. that um, so I, I got frustrated during that process and it wasn't until uni that I kind of realized, you know what, as long as I find a way of talking about it, I can draw whatever I want. I can be in whatever style I want. But at school, it was always a struggle. Leading on from GCSEs, mm. for you choosing your subject at, at university, mm. I know that, like we said, you naturally chose art. Was it always going to be art? Did you decide to go for graphics design instead yeah that, that was a kind of interesting one so i um obviously there's a few choices i did my art foundation and and we got to try everything we did a bit of fine art some graphics we did fashion which was fun <laughs> um but uh but yeah out of all of them i think the one that kind of fitted me most was graphics because with graphics it it felt a bit more tangible it felt like you know i'm creating stuff i'm using my illustration skills but it's going to something uh not as conceptual it, it's really kind of concrete which i like yeah um and then what what's funny what happened actually so i'm a photographer now as well as an illustrator but i stayed away from photography for a long time because i thought it was too easy not like a, you know honest illustration where you have to draw everything yeah um and it took you know a little while into photography to realize how challenging it was but at the time i was um i did i studied graphics and I started, me and my flatmates started a design company while we were studying. And as we were doing design work over and over again, we'd need images because, you know, it's so photo based, we need stock images and we were paying way too much for it. So we thought, let's just get a camera. Yeah. And I think we got one camera between us and then he got a camera. And as soon as you had a camera, this was like over a decade ago. So, you know, everyone didn't have great cameras on their phones. And when people know you have a camera, they're like, oh, I've got an event or I'm, you know, I'm promoting my brand that I'm starting. Yeah. Can you photograph it for me? And it got to the stage very quickly where we were getting more money from photography than the actual design work itself. So really? that, that, <laughs> that kind of financially, it was great. But it was also, you know, like the quote, like we said, I was being challenged every time I went to take photos. I was learning something new. So I was really now motivated to do the photography as well as uh, as well as the design side. And was that, did you feel like you had, because you started getting paid for photos or yeah. doing it for free. And were you then like, oh, I actually need to learn more about this before I carry on pushing it? Kind of. It was a bit of both because it was also, it was just fun to learn. You know, yeah. I, 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 I guess I made the mistake. The guy I started the company with, my best friend going through school. And so we got a flat together. Um, he was studying medicine at the time and right. I was studying graphics. But while he was studying medicine, he was really into design, especially web design. And um, and yeah, we we started kind of uh, both getting into photography for the same reason. And it's dangerous because, you know, we're just two guys getting into photography. We're just pushing each other. So every time I'd buy an expensive lens, he'd have to buy the same <laughs> lens. And, um, but then also technically we'd go out and try new things and just try different techniques and I think about, we had a flat in London and three nights out of every week, we'd probably go out at night and just do long exposure photography or, or street photography. And it really, really helped us improve really quickly. And it was that that probably took it to the next level as much as, you know, thinking, oh, they're paying me for this now. Um, and I think that experimentation side was so important for, for becoming better as a photographer. I think that's, I think it's so important that I think a lot of people now, 
they jump in and they they either use their phone or they kind of take photos, but they don't realize actually the the time it takes to actually learn and understand the deeper impact of how to take photos. Yeah. And you just naturally did that out of a passion for it and a love for it. Yeah. What would you say if someone if someone picked up a camera now, either a DSLR or their iPhone? What would you say is a good way to start? What would be a good place to begin? Where should they go? Should, you did night photography. Is that a good place to start? Was that yeah. an interesting concept to do? Yeah, I think night photography is a huge one because um, there, there's just technical limitations. You're going to put on a camera by shooting at night that you don't have in the middle of the day. Mm. In the middle of the day, a lot of cameras are just as good as each other because everything's helping you. The light's perfect and stuff. When you get to night photography, you have to start learning settings because that's the only way your shots are going to come out well is is playing with challenging light. So I'd say, yeah, night photography with a tripod, if you're struggling to understand how ISO and shutter speed and aperture and all of that kind of stuff works, um, do more night photography. <laughs> You'll start That's to really figure it out. Um, but I also think uh, the element that I had with having someone around you who's as into what you're doing as you are. Yeah. You know, people are always going to push each other if they're, if they're in the same kind of area. So it's nice now. A lot of the young photographers that are doing amazing things now that I talk about that I talked to, sorry, when they started out, um, they found other people that were about the same stage as them on social media and they did, did photographic meetups and they'd go to locations with these people and you just push each other. So I'd say if you can have someone who's interested in the same thing as you, who's around the same level as experience, try and connect and do things with them because you'll push each other. You'll probably push each other to spend a lot of money on equipment, but that's that's like a that's a little side effect that you got to do. With. You that is the bit of that way, yeah. The life of a photographer is absolutely it? yeah. <laughs> the amount of extra stuff I buy for my drum kit, where I'm like, this yeah. will be the last thing I need, of course, and yeah. then I'm done. Yeah, and then like, have you seen this? I was like, I've uh, not seen that. Why that? did you have to release what? a new lens? Like, why would you do that? To me? Yeah. yeah, and and I think it's so I think it's so key about finding that group. Yeah. When I was chatting to to Liam and and Jess, it was yeah. again. It was finding that group. It's a people who you can ask questions of, and they might not have the answer, but they are asking the same question. Yeah. And then you can find out together. I I remember when I was teaching photography, and the guy who was like learning stuff from me then said, "Are you part of the Hampshire Photography Facebook group?" And I was like, I don't even know there is a Facebook group for this. And I yeah. went and there's like 40,000 people who are part of this. Oh, crazy. Yeah. And they take photos and then they upload it. And it okay. the the description was you you had to take a photo within the county. Okay. So yeah. you couldn't go outside of the county. So then other people in that county could go to that location and and take photos there and see how they could do something similar. Yeah. And I thought it was a really interesting concept. It's funny you mentioned that, yeah, because a lot of um... – a lot of the things that kind of motivated me to try something new would be based on locations because we'd be going out late at London at night. And I do remember one uh, time we were by uh, Guys of St. Thomas Hospital just overlooking uh, Big Ben on, yeah. on, on the far side of the river. And we got this shot that we thought, this is amazing. No one's ever taken the shot before. And <laughs> I, it's just, you know, I am the inventor <laughs> yeah, I, of I am this the first shot. <laughs> to take Big Ben at night. Um, but then looking afterwards and seeing other people taking from similar angles but then seeing someone who i know you've copied my photo and i didn't feel bad about it i was like that's amazing <laughs> you yeah know, i've i've got something that someone's trying to emulate now and i think i use that now a lot because i do a lot of um wedding photography and things like that and a lot of my research process if someone's getting married and they want to take like their family sh you know portrait shoots at kew gardens or something my starting point a lot of the time is, you know, look up Kew Garden engagement photos or something like that mm. and just see how people have used those areas, how they've used that environment to take great shots. It's a really good way if you're looking to get inspired. Um, you know, it's cool to, to look for a great photographer that you know, but if he's taking photos on the other side of the world, you know, you're not going to be able to replicate that same kind of mood. If it's an yeah. area that you're going to be in, you can see different ways that people approach that setting and, um, and try new things from there. That's really interesting. And do you find that that's, that's the way you've gained inspiration yeah. more so? And I guess because – so you take photos editing-wise. Yeah. Because I know I can stand next to someone, we can take the same shot, and then it will look totally different out of our cameras. And then by the time we've edited them, they yeah. look even more different. Yeah. Do you find that being able to take a photo in the same location as maybe someone else did and then editing it to try and get it to look similar – 
from yeah. that inspiration? Do you find the editing process is quite key for you? Yeah, I think so. It's, it's an interesting one because, it, you know, they, you know, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery and yeah. all of that. But I think with, um, if that happens, if I, if I see a single photo, usually it's like a single photo that might inspire me a lot from an area. Um, it's not so much the technically how did they do that that I'm trying to emulate. It's more of the what is the mood that they're getting in that photo and how would I go about creating that mood. And I might do it a completely different set of way using a completely different set of tools than they've used when they're editing. But if I can recreate the mood that I like, that that's kind of what I'm going for. So yeah. again, I use kind of engagement photos as an example. I remember one thing that kind of made me change my whole approach to how I edit and light portraits was seeing, uh, I think it was in St. James's Park or something, but I had an engagement shoot in St. James's Park uh, coming up and I just went online and you know, saw engagement shoot St. James's Park. And the way someone had really kind of played with the lighting to give a really golden, warm glow to the portrait. Yeah. I was like, I want that. <laughs> you know, I'm going to be great. That have one. No idea how they did it technically, but so many of my portraits since then, just that that kind of glow that they had about them, I try and recreate and it it works really great, really, really well in a whole variety of different situations. So, And do you think that shaped your photography quite a bit, like through the years? You yeah. found a photo which has been like, ooh, I kind of, because I guess kind of like has musicians change the mood and the style of their genre yeah like you kind of change the style of how you take photos would would you say that that happened to you it is how? yeah it's it's an approach though it's like it's um in you know i get a lot of people coming up to me sometimes i teach like photography workshops and people will be like how did you make this what did you do to make this and yeah. it's like that's that's almost the wrong question you know I, I think the question is um if you find a photo that you like can you deconstruct what you like about it Mm. you know and and i think it's the same with art as well if i see an image that i really like i have to be able to deconstruct what's good about this and then once i've broken down those raw ingredients like building them up and using them again and recreating that mood that becomes possible yeah if you just have a vague understanding of oh i like this photo but you don't know what it is about the photo that you like you're never going to be able to kind of improve with those elements yourself so i think that deconstructing what you like about something is a really really important part of getting better in any discipline and do you do you do that through because i know you said you're quite a visual person yeah. when you, you would draw stuff out yeah. if you look at a photo and this might be you're like no why would yeah. i do that but um do you, do you draw out and like write down what you think of that photo to deconstruct or is it just in your head you you deconstruct yeah I, I think it's more in my head um so but, you don't draw sorry like yeah. what is the mist of this i, I would love set? to like i'd love to have that kind of rain man kind of approach just <laughs> i stick photos on the wall and like have strings connecting uh, and stuff. <laughs> um but no I, th I think it is at least now it's it's like a mental thing you know that i, I kind of look and instantly see you know is it how how far in they've got with the vignette, how, how, you know, shallow the depth of field is or whatever. I'm, I'm kind of analyzing that almost on automatic, but if you're starting out, I would say, yeah, it actually does make sense to, to write it down, to really like deconstruct it. Yeah. Um, especially, and especially in graphic design as well. I think design is a, is a huge one. Um, if you're doing, you know, if you're designing an app or a website or some of these things that, it's essential to be able to break down what is it that I like about this and can I recreate it myself? But yeah, I think in photography, definitely when you're starting out, do it if it helps write it down. But I think over time you'll kind of take on board automatically. I can just see something and know what works and try and recreate that. It's kind of like you assess it. Yeah. yeah. I found once I've been shown techniques or been taught a technique, when I see the next photo I see, I'm like, oh, yeah. interesting. That's the reason why I've always liked that photo is because yeah. of the technique they've used, which I didn't even clock when yeah. I first, that's yeah, very interesting. 100%. So moving through, I guess, photography and you learning about photography was really interesting. When you found genres you like to take photos of, I know we've talked about weddings. Yes. How did documentary photography become a thing? Because I, everyone says find, find your niche within an industry yeah. and then get to know everyone in that niche and then you'll explore and get more work for someone who actually wants to yeah. get paid for it how did you find documentary photography um yeah it's it's definitely i mean photography is, is a people business you know you can have all the best gear in the world and be technically proficient at it but if 
your rapport with people isn't good any area of photography that will kind of show up yeah um and it is it's through i mean most of my work now kind of comes from contacts that i've worked with before and recommendations um but i think with documentary photography i think the first big project that i can remember i did with a videographer who i'd done weddings with before so this guy we'd done a few weddings he was a friend of mine and he was like i've got this series that i want to shoot um which was a historical documentary um called lineage and um when he first told me about it it was uh the idea was to go up to scotland and film like a long episode maybe have a half an hour documentary out of it on the trip up we we just talked about the possibilities and especially trying to gear it towards today's generation with maybe a lower attention span and one half an hour documentary turned into 55 minute mini documentaries you know and uh that then become a much longer project because it wasn't just scotland it was like the whole of europe we were going to go around and all of that which basically kind of became my life for six months yeah (laughs) was from you know from this this you know our connection usually being through wedding photography and it's kind of uh the reverse is true i've just come back from kenya i was shooting a wedding in kenya which is amazing but it all happened because I'd been on a trip to India, which is more documentary kind of shooting, uh, with a lot, with a medical team who were doing some medical work out there. And the everyone on that trip, it was the same guy that you know was doing the video, that did the other documentary, and myself doing the media. And they saw some of our work, and they were like, "Oh wow, you guys, we really like your wedding photography as well." And jokingly, everyone was like, you know what, we're all from different countries, but if we get married, we'll fly you all out to do our weddings. And we all had a laugh. And a few years later, that's literally what's happened. <laughs> I've been no to yeah, America, Australia and stuff like that. What, to shoot all or, of those people's weddings? It's Yeah, they, they've literally all got married and then said, can you guys come and do our weddings? So I literally <laughs> just got back from Kenya last week after doing the same thing. So yeah, your, your rapport with people will naturally kind of lead to to that happening obviously your work has to be up to you know a good standard for them to want to do it but if someone sees you really proficient in one area they're they're going to want to kind of work with you again in other areas and your rapport like what and this might be you've never even thought about it but what do you think people like about you and the way you go about work yeah um you tell (laughs) me yeah (laughs) um do you know what i think a huge huge part of it is is it sounds almost cliche but your professionalism you know your approach to your work um i think people people kind of gain confidence from you seeming like you're kind of established and know what you're doing and a lot of people uh i think in in kind of the visual arts and illustration and photography especially they do struggle because knowing how to approach things like pricing for a client and things like that it, it's it's a bit of a minefield. You don't necessarily know how to start. One thing that I've realized is I'd kind of take the approach that I would want. You know, if I was asking someone to provide a service, I would love to have a itemized kind of breakdown of what that service entails. It's yeah. a bit harder in creative industries, but I've found things like when I'm charging someone for say wedding photography, I'll already have kind of a rate card listed with everything that they can get in that kind of it as as an option yeah and they can kind of pick and choose and it, it's almost you know it's speaking their language it's people who are used to going to like restaurants or paying for particular services that are all listed and itemized giving them that option makes it really easy to deal with them instead of feeling like you just have to pluck a number out of the air and it's great for you as a creative as well because it means a lot less hassle having to work out prices every time you have a different job yeah um so i think that kind of straightforward kind of business-like approach is one thing but then the second thing is just going above and beyond. I think you you really have to kind of do that with, um, especially with things like wedding photography now. One thing that I always try and do, and I don't know if I should say this on the podcast because then it's not a surprise anymore, but I like to <laughs> I like to surprise. If I take wedding photos for a client, I like to kind of surprise them by the same night. So when I get home on the wedding day, actually looking through, I know through the course of the day, what I think are probably the 10 best moments. Yeah, I'll take those 10 best photos and edit them straight away and give them to the couple before I go to bed that night. No. And it's something completely unexpected because you don't expect to have your photos the same day. But it's it's just, it's really good for them because they don't have to wait at least to have something and then you can take a little bit of time over the rest of the images. Um, but it's good for you as well. I mean, it's adapting to kind of 
a different environment now where everyone's taking photos on their phones. You don't want to be, as the official photographer, the last person to contribute to that. So it's good from your point of view as well. So I think doing that is just a little extra that most photographers, you can't guarantee that you'll offer that. It's obviously tiring if you've driven two hours from a wedding to come home and then start editing. Yeah. But if you can deliver stuff like that, it's the sort of thing people remember and you'll definitely get recommendations based on that. That's incredible. Yeah. And I guess, does that then alleviate, I guess it's a twofold thing because you, you have that amazing moment, but then does that alleviate you getting the other photos to them a little, a little bit. bit yeah i mean so if, like enjoy if please. you've got nothing you've just got married it's like the biggest day of your life you're waiting you're like itching to get at least something yeah um and so if you've got you know 10 15 photos you've got all the fodder that you want for your social media accounts for the next couple of weeks totally. then it's not that desperation to get something and getting called all the time to, um so yeah it, it really helps your process in terms of now you can edit in peace and I would never recommend trying to do all the photos in the next couple of days after a wedding because you know you need sleep and you need fresh eyes and things. But um, but yeah, that that's for me. That's kind of working smart. You know, yes, yeah. is, is managing your time in that way. And do you and did that come out of nowhere? Did you do it once and you were like, wow, yeah. they really responded to that, or was that always going to be your it's, thing? Yeah, it's it kind of came by accident, and and the reason was I was so excited about some shots that I taken at this wedding, and I was like, I don't want to have to wait to give these to the people. <laughs> Let me at least take those moments. And I think it was spontaneous moments in the day where I'd, I'd told them to do something a little bit kind of just random. Yeah. And it worked super well. And I was like, I really want to show them how well this has worked. So, um, so I sent it to them and their reaction was great because that same night they posted on social media, you know, how was our photographer got our photos to us before our heads hit the pillow. And then, That's you know, bad, the, the, the feedback from their guests and stuff was great. And I got, a few extra jobs out of it so yeah it worked well and do you find i guess with wedding photography like you said any photography is a lot of word of mouth yeah um, or building rapport with the people around you yeah i, I guess it comes to um so i, I have a confession to make is uh, yeah. i'm i'm not the best at managing my social media accounts yeah. as as dedicated as i should be i i um i post every couple of years <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh um but no i'm trying to get better at that this year new resolution <laughs> hold it. me to it yeah um but i think one reason is at this stage of my career i don't have to rely on it because most of my work and it's enough work definitely to live on comes from recommendations from you know other people there'll still be some people who like come across my stuff and, and contact me out of the blue um, but a recommendation from someone who's used you before is going to be so much stronger than just someone who stumbles across um, your stuff. So I'd say definitely strive to build up that reputation um, for reliability, for friendliness and stuff that is going to keep people wanting to come back to you. I'd say when you're starting out, it's such a saturated market that if you can use social media in a really effective way, then that's kind of essential. Yeah. Um, but I'd say don't rely on that being your only kind of source of work it has to kind of come from you having a reputation yeah um, yeah so the opportunities you do get in the beginning yeah even if it's working for free yeah it's it's taking them on and being as professional as possible 100 yeah. percent. because you have no idea who that person knows or who's yeah. going to be in the room when you're i think especially if you're working for free i think i think there's this dangerous mindset that people have sometimes which is i'm going to give as much effort as the amount of being paid for and that's really dangerous because you just don't know how these recommendations and things work. I think some of my biggest opportunities have come from free work that I've done. And um, and it's because I've kind of approached them with no kind of distinction. No matter how much someone's paying me, I've got to give the same level of service. And people, you know, people really appreciate that. And did you, did you seek out the people you've worked for free for or um, did they approach you? and say, hey, can you work for free? I think generally they approach me. Uh, right. It's, um, I, I think in terms of like uh, the event photography or wedding photography, a lot of that has been um, stuff that happened in the early days when I was first starting out and I was very glad of the experience. Yeah. Um, in terms of things like illustration projects, it's it's been really different depending on the client. You know, there might be someone doing a project that I really, really believe in. And in that case... You know, I'm I'm happy to work for free because I really want to see this project succeed. Yeah. Um, but again, that's then led to other work. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I, I tend not to go out looking for free. <laughs> <projects 'cause I laughs> Will gotta, you let me work for eat, free? You know? yeah. <laughs> um, 
but but I'd, yeah, I definitely say don't don't turn your nose down at them, but do have do start having that plan for how is this going to actually allow me to make a living? Because mm. if you really love it and you want to be doing it full time and making a living off it, um, you've got to sort of get to the stage where charging people isn't an uncomfortable thing. That's the that's the everyday, not the exception to the rule. Yeah, I think that's really interesting, and and maybe even taking it as if you are going to work for free. How are you going to utilize that time for experience, but also yeah. the images you get? How are you going to showcase those to then yeah. have a portfolio and, and get more work? Your portfolio better be really strong at the end of yeah, yeah at the end of that free work. Yeah. I think one of my favorite uh, videos I ever watched on YouTube was a guy who said, "If you if you do something, if you make content and you mm. put effort into that content, yeah. you need to then create eight things out of that content to to post to show people something yeah. like that. So it could be that you have." Uh, like this podcast and I'm going to try and make three videos out of this along with the photos, along yeah. with a, a story. And so even though it was an hour, the, 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 it will go way past then because you need to break that into bits of content to put on different areas. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah and that's what that. you can do with the free work. It's yeah. how could this build, like you're saying, build a portfolio of work, which is. And that's the beauty of it. I mean, if you've done, amazing work it's always there you know i think uh you know even for, <laughs> i don't know if i'm allowed to say this but even for this podcast i was looking for a photo for the podcast and yeah. I, I had to go back like seven years <laughs> to uh <laughs> to a photo i had seven years ago but it was you know it's a moment that we took and it's still there it's still on my hard drives i still have access to it so any work that you create will be will be around for you to use in that way mm. but yeah i think definitely find a way to kind of rationalize why you're doing this work and is it is it helping you grow? Is it helping you get better? Yeah, very interesting. Now I know that we've talked about photography quite a bit, mm. but you also have a massive, you're nearly 50-50 with the photography yeah. you do and then the illustration you do. Yeah. I know you set up that business during university. Did that carry on? Did it turn into something different? Yeah, it's <laughs> so a funny story. We we had this design business and um we I was at the university kind of during sort of two thousand eight, the kind of credit crunch and things. And um a great time for a, Yeah, uh, <laughs> not a great time if you're looking for a job. Yeah. You know. So <laughs> the the amazing thing was without knowing that was coming, we'd set up this company, me and my flatmate, and um he was a very good web designer and he managed to make us a website for our company that looked super professional so we ended up getting a few clients that should have been out of our league but we were like great um and then the the weirdest thing is there was a period where we started getting people asking for work experience and we were like two 19 year old guys operating out of our living room and i think the funniest day for me is i was i studied at the university of the arts london at lcc and I was on an undergrad degree and we had a guy who was on a master's degree contact me and asked me for work experience. And this guy's like, you know, late twenties. <laughs> and I, I had to explain to him, no, I'm not who you think I am, but, uh, <laughs> but it was great, you know? And, um, and so that, that kind of grew, we ended up, um, selling that company as we were working together and we, um, uh, and then I started working just for myself as an illustrator and, um, it's the illustration's been great because it's been really varied. You know, some of the projects that I do have been uh, book illustrations. Some of them has been sort of private commissions, and it definitely stops me from going crazy um, having a lot of different creative outlets. And um, you know, trying to put in as much effort with one as the other has been has been the kind of balancing act. Um, but I think. You know, the people who most inspire me are the people who do more than one thing. You know, my ultimate creative is someone like Leonardo da Vinci. He just, you know, not a jack of all trades because everything he does, he does well, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> but I genuinely think this is like one of the most exciting times to be alive if you're a creative because it's so accessible to get into other areas. Yeah. And I honestly think there's no reason to limit yourself to one area. If you're a great photographer, be a great photographer. But if you want to be a great guitarist as well, there's literally nothing to stop you. So, as, as you are learning the guitar, I'm right sure now. I didn't want to say anything. Is that, yeah. <laughs> um, and my album but, will be coming out yeah. in it. <laughs> but honestly, I mean that as that as a as a basis. I mean, the funny thing about that is, if I did, you know, time is the only restriction really. If I really put in the time to play guitar and write songs and decide to come out with an album. The idea that I could, well, you know what? I could do my own album artwork or I could do my own music video and all of this, I actually have the skills to be involved in. 
and to do myself. There's so much freedom in having that really varied skill set. And if you're trying to be a creative who gets paid for what they're doing, being able to not outsource half the things that you're doing is is an amazing thing. So yeah, yeah. even if it's you're not going to be, even if it's you're never going to get to the standard that you are yeah. as a photographer as a musician it's still amazing to have that ability and to have it yeah. to a degree where you then don't have to look for someone look to someone else to get that yeah. work that's yeah. such an interesting point yeah and, I, and worst case scenario is that you increase your understanding in that area you know mm. Even now if i'm doing things like album covers whether illustrated or photographic for musicians i kind of get a bit more what they're going through when they're playing their music and that's that's really helpful because the work I then do for them is going to be informed by that. So yeah. there's, it's a win-win situation. There's no, there's no kind of losing factor to doing that. I think the only thing to kind of guard against is that you don't spread yourself thin and do a hundred things badly. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. still, it's still something where I'd say put in the time to be good at whatever it is you're trying to pursue. But you know, nothing's closed off to you anymore. You can, you can really kind of explore whatever avenue that you're interested in. That's really interesting. And do you, when, when did you decide you wanted to look at playing the guitar? Was it just on a whim or was it you've always yeah. thought, oh, I'd like to know more about music? It's it's weird. Like music is an area that was always like a real kind of blind spot. Like I couldn't, I had no musical talent or ability whatsoever. And, and that annoyed me because, you know, you'd go to someone's house and they'd have a piano in the corner and you yeah. wanted to just be able to sit down and, you know, get into it. And I literally, I, I didn't have one note that I could play after another that would be, a, you know. Um, so I I kind of, I thought to myself, I'd like to have some kind of something musical yeah. in my life because I love music. And I really like the thought of just being around a group of friends and breaking out a guitar and, you know, sing along to a song that you all know. And then, you know, that thought rushed through my mind. Well, I've, I've learned photography from no, you know, no previous background. I've learned other stuff that like that way. So surely, yeah, guitar is an option as well. And so I had a friend of mine who had a spare guitar. And I said, before I spend any money on this, could I borrow your guitar for, a, you know, or she offered actually, you know, do you want to borrow the guitar for a few months? Tried playing for like a month or two. And I was like, I could, I could keep doing this. Yeah. So, so far it's been, I think about 10 months, something like that. But I can, I can play a couple of songs, nice. you know. It's, and I, I had that moment. I set myself the the challenge of, uh, one of my favorite guitar songs is Redemption Song by Bob Marley. Right. And I said, when I can play that, I'll know I'm, I'm committed. I'm doing this, for, you know, for, forever now. And, and yeah, I had a really nice moment a couple of weeks ago. We were just sitting around with some friends. I started playing the song. People were singing along. I was like, yeah, we did it. We got here. It happened. Yeah. Do you find setting yourselves little short-term goals is really nice for motivation? Yeah. I, is that more so with the music or do you do that for your photography and your art? I think with the music, it was kind of essential because I thought this might be something I just give up. Like I just yeah. realized I can do it this far and that's my limit. Yeah. And, uh, setting a goal like, okay, this is the song you want to be playing by then or you want to, you know, have your finger style stuff worked out is that was a goal I needed to keep going. But I think with the, with the other stuff, with the art and illustration, it's a different challenge because I think when you get into a habit, uh, almost like a habit of doing work for money, you know, you have job after job after job coming in, it can get really mechanical. Yeah. And that's dangerous because you start to kind of lose your love for photography or you lose your love for illustration. It's just, I have to get these deadlines done. And so I think with that, it's not so much a challenge of setting milestones. It's a challenge of stepping away from you know, the work that you're being paid to do and making sure you're still doing this in your free time as a creative, self-motivated with the aim of getting better. Yeah. I think, um, and sometimes that means just cutting it down on the amount of work that you're taking on board, you know, which is hard when, you know, you've got rent to pay, paid work's coming in, but sometimes you have to be like, no, I can't do another kind of paid job like this because I need time to kind of decompress and still do photography for fun, <laughs> you know, or do illustration for fun. I think it, it's so interesting where it's trying to find that balance of you at the start, you're so craving to get any sort yeah. of <laughs> paid work that yeah. suddenly when you're in the position where you can even remotely consider yeah. to turn down jobs, yeah, it, like, it takes everything in your being to be like, it's crazy, I should yeah. take this, I should actually take that three hours to do something where it might actually not be 100% what I want to do. Yeah. 
but I'm getting paid for it. Actually take those three hours to explore a new technique or something yeah. that actually can take that time I mean, for self-learning. It, it is weird. You kind of struggle with guilt sometimes if you know, oh, I've got this commission that needs to be done by next week and I'm learning, using this time to learn animation or something like that. You yeah. feel like, is this the best use of my time? But honestly, it is because you need to, you know, it's like if you're trying to get fit, you don't go to the gym 24-7 because <laughs> your muscles need to grow at some stage. It was that learning kind of side where you need to just step away from paid work and get onto the kind of inspirational learning part of it. So with with everything we chatted about mm. so far, like where would people start to learn? I know that for me, and I know we chatted about it just yeah. now, uh, PH Learn, Flern, Flern on yeah. YouTube has done yeah. some amazing stuff for free where you can learn about Photoshop and other things. Is there anywhere else where you consume you consume content to actually help you develop your art or your yeah. photography. Yeah, I think for me, I mean, obviously online now there's there's just so much. There's a couple of a couple of artists that I realized recently I'd been looking at. And it's weird because I've been an illustrator, professional illustrator for a while, but it just shows there's always techniques you can learn. There's uh, two that have been really helpful to me in the last few years when I was getting more into digital. Uh, one is a guy called Aaron Blaze. Uh, he's got a really kind of big following on YouTube and Instagram, but he was sort of lead animator for Disney um, during oh, wow. some of the golden years, you know, Lion King and and Aladdin and things like that. Um, but it's really interesting because he comes from a 2D animation background and had to kind of reteach himself um, digital art on Photoshop. And he's got some amazing Photoshop or digital art tutorials. And I think watching... Him was amazing because if you ever deal with animators, you know they really have to be grounded in the physics and the the mechanics of drawing things accurately. And I'm really attracted to that. So yeah. um, seeing someone who who does who does that kind of stuff has been amazing. There's um, another guy uh, uh, you can look for him is just Proko P R O K O. Okay. His name's Stan Prokopenko, but he's uh, an, another amazing illustrator who goes back to the kind of fundamentals. Um, but presents them online on YouTube and on Instagram. And I think there's quite a few guys like that that I follow that are just great teachers. And I think that's one thing that I'd say is is kind of essential. It's not just finding someone who's an amazing artist or an amazing photographer, but the way they teach techniques has to be something where almost like if someone could explain something to a child, that's the kind of teacher I want. Someone yeah. who breaks things down to their really en elemental concepts. And yeah. Those are a couple of examples from art that I found. Uh, but also I, I teach, I do a lot of workshops um, around photography and illustration. And that's that's kind of my approach too. I really want to get um, people's understanding, just break it down to quite a basic level and kind of build up from there. Yeah. Um, and so. you can always find, you can, if you, no matter where you are, if you don't have, uh, so you might be lucky enough to be in London where there are yeah. free tutorials out there for photography and art. Yeah, um, yeah. But you can then, if you can't find that, you can look through the YouTubes and there's yeah. always going to be someone there who yeah, who has made a video on something you're interested in. Absolutely. For yeah. my dad, he's redoing his van. And there are so many van people out this there who have redone their vans. And <laughs> there's a big community. And there's some a community of, them, of van guys. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And it's like, I want to change the light bulb in the top left corner of the van. And it's like, someone's made a video about that. And Do you it's... know what? It, it hit me, you know, a little while ago. We are in the matrix. This is literally, you know, <laughs> I want to fly a helicopter. Let me plug my brain into YouTube and now I can fly a helicopter. Oh, that's mad, isn't it? And <laughs> it's, it's scary, but it's great. You know, I, I, I hope I'm not taking it too far, but I want to get to the stage where one day I'm going to build my own house off YouTube videos. I'm no. just going to like... <laughs> everything i need yeah the dream uh, that's the dream, that's, yeah. that's when you know you made we'll, it we'll get there <laughs> <laughs> but um but how about you you've asked me a lot of questions like how, how about you for learning where you know i would say what's it with you youtube is for me an amazing place to be inspired by people and mm. also learn uh, for my drumming someone i i find really really exciting to watch yeah. is pocket queen on instagram okay yeah. she's got like two hundred thousand subscribers but uh, for me because she puts out track after track and they're just so good and it just makes me want to get behind my drum kit and play yeah and i think that's the the quickest way to learn is just by playing the instrument over and over again yeah. and that's where i go for inspiration is instagram so pocket queen and ash Sone, okay who's yeah. actually the drummer he was voted best session drummer of the year yeah like last year and he's always up there but he's the drummer for the voice uk okay like yeah. he's that guy wow. in the back um, but he's done amazing work yeah. for some incredible artists but he's someone again who just 
just puts up videos and I think that's the key me. thing, yeah, what you're saying is they're prolific. I think any of the guys that I follow um, much better than me at doing this, but they will put out things over and over again. And what's really weird is sometimes I go back at the people I'm learning from and just look at their first and second and third video and see how far they've come in teaching other people. They've just developed amazingly as artists, which is interesting. It's very cool. Yeah. Nice. I guess my last question before we finish up is if you get to, I know people when they, they're older, they look back and they think about their legacy. Yeah. What do you think you want to leave behind as a photographer and an illustrator? So this is, um, is something I think about quite a lot. A lot of the work I do, um, especially the stuff with like the charities and the documentaries that I've worked on, the thing that's kept me motivated and the thing that's kept me wanting to get better is that there's there's an impact to it. Um, I remember I uh, mentioned at the start of the trip uh, that we did a, a few years ago now to um, Bangladesh and India. We were shooting this documentary um, and it was looking at the effects of climate change on different communities. And we had um, we had a really weird trip because we landed in, in uh, I think it was West India, Northwest India, where... The, the weather changing has led to really severe droughts. And our driver, we asked the driver that we were with, you know, do you know anyone? He's like, I'll take you to my parents' house. And we went to see his parents were on a farm and it was just so arid and, you know, there wasn't anything growing there. And they said, this is like recent effects of, of the weather changing. And then we went to Bangladesh and Bangladesh is the opposite. They're having torrential floods and villages were kind of being washed away. And then we went down to stay with some subsistence fishermen. Right. And so being subsistence fishermen, what they catch is what they eat. That's how they feed their families. And one effect that they'd seen really over the last decade is the fish stocks have just been overfished, depleted. There's nothing there and they're really, really struggling. And so we went there and just had a really emotional experience because we asked, is there one person that we can interview about this and then the guy who lived there said yeah sure well i'll get someone tomorrow come back tomorrow to the village and we came back and the whole village was there like hundreds of people were sitting around in a circle and we were interviewing one guy but the whole village had turned out to watch and as we're interviewing him the translators translating what we're saying but we see him breaking down in tears and you're looking around at the other hundreds of people gathered around and they're breaking down in tears and their whole thing was just to say, guys, you have to put this out. You have to let the world know what's happening here because nobody cares about us basically starving. Mm-hmm. And this thing that you're making, are you going to put it out and tell the world? And that definitely stayed with me is that, you know, there's, it, it's kind of motivating, you know, getting better as a photographer, getting better as an artist, putting your work out there, getting a big following. But realizing that, you know, photography, video illustration has a huge, huge power to make people aware of things that they're not usually aware of. Um, that that really motivates me. I remember a few years ago as well, we, you know, during the height of the kind of the refugee crisis in Calais, um, some friends and I went out mainly with the aim of just helping. You know, I took some cameras along, but I didn't want to be that guy, <laughs> you yeah. know, that's just, you know, photographing people in their pain. But, um but yeah, some of the relief efforts I took photos of and, you know, I just gave them, you know, I wasn't hired to do it, but I gave them to the organizers and they're like, thanks, it's going to be quite useful. And I went back a few months later and they had materials, which was like how to operate in the camp, you know, guidelines and stuff. And it was illustrated with photos that I'd taken. I was like, okay, this is, this is great. This is what I want to be doing. This is yeah. actually helping a situation with photography rather than just you know, voluntourism, <laughs> just being yeah. there to, you know, get shots for the gram or whatever. So I think that that's the kind of legacy that I, I would love to have. You know, we've seen it through history, how powerful a single image can be. Yeah. And I think as an image maker, you know, if by the end of my career I can point to, you know, examples of, okay, I took this photo, I did this design, or I did this illustration, and that changed things for individuals. And that's, you know, that, that's what I want to leave behind, I think. Very cool. Ashley, thank you so much for coming today. Cool. Thank if you. anyone wants to find any of Ashley's work, it is on Instagram. It's Ashley Bloom Images. Yeah, Ashley Bloom Images. And on 
Google, if you Google uh, (laughs) AshleyBloom.net, that will come up with his website, with all of his work. Cool. Yeah, Ashley, thank you so much for having me. Thank you, man. Great great to be here. Awesome chat. Cheers. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much for listening to the very end of this podcast. It really means a lot. If you have enjoyed it, please do leave a review and comment what you like about it. Wherever you listen to your podcasts, it helps us out hugely. Our next episode will be out next Monday, so subscribe to get notified. And finally, if you could go to Instagram and follow Creative Catalyst Podcast, we will be sharing all the work from the creators we interview on there. So if you want to see what they've been up to, please go take a look at our Instagram account. Thank you very much.